I'm Professor Ed Byrne, the President and Vice-Chancellor of Monash University, and I'm enormously delighted to welcome you to tonight's event, Monash, the Outsider Who Ended a War. As you came in the door tonight, you were greeted by one of the young scholars working on the centennial history of Anzac Day. This is one of the largest Australian Research Council projects in the humanities, and Monash University is very proud to lead it. The folder you were given as you came in contains news of publications and events. It announces an international conference to be held on the shores of the Dardanelles in April 2015, and it invites you to take part in a national survey on the meaning of Anzac Day. Anzac Day, as Roland will probably remind us, was one of John Monash's many great passions. We warmly invite our alumni to, to participate in this survey and in all the events that Monash University has planned to mark the centenary of the Great War. So, I'm really delighted to welcome you again to tonight's event, Monash the Outsider Who Ended a War. Tonight, we delve into the life of a great Australian, one of the very greatest Australians, Sir John Monash. Monash University takes its name from Sir John, but we take more than his name, we also take inspiration from his philosophy. He was a man who used education to turn his natural talent into a true ability, allowing him to realize his daring ambitions. He believed education was a lifelong endeavor. Our university motto from Michelangelo, Ancora Imparo, I am still learning, captures the essence of Monash's approach to life. Sir John Monash left a legacy as a scholar and a man of action. He was a man who sought, above all else, to use his education and abilities for the benefit of the community. Who better to provide an insight into Sir John's remarkable life than alumnus and author of Sir John Monash's biography, Professor Roland Perry, our resident uh, writer. Joining Professor Perry tonight is Professor Mary Finsterer of the Sir Zellman Cowan School of Music, who has composed original music for the presentation. Actor Dr. Felix Nobis from the Faculty of Arts will recite from Sir John's own letters. So without further ado, please join me uh, in welcoming uh, our uh, uh, principal uh, uh, contributors tonight, Professor Roland Perry. <laughs> Professor Mary Finsterer. Dr. Felix Nobis. <laughs> Pianist, Dr. Kenji Fujimura. <laughs> and musicians, Ishun uh, Chuk Mukchi Ulu, Emma Charles, and Amy Chepjan. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Byrne, and welcome everyone. Sir John Monash was a product of the gold rush to Victoria. He was born to German Jewish immigrant parents in 1865 in Melbourne. He was a brilliant student, becoming Ducks of Scotch College in 1881, and he was a prodigy at the piano. Young Monash performed in Melbourne's concert halls and could have been a professional. Every day he played his favourite composers, Mendelssohn, Weber, Beethoven and Chopin. Monash's most requested pieces were Chopin's Polonaise and Poet and Peasant. His mother Bertha was his greatest supporter and number one fan. Monash never played with more passion for her than when she was dying in 1885.
Monash was an amateur magician as a teenager who impressed the girls with card tricks at parties. When it came to war, he turned into a master illusionist. One of many examples was his creation of dummy tanks to fool the enemy. When a fog lifted in the early morning of a major battle, opposition forces believed they were facing an onslaught of many more tanks than were actually there. He had a few fetishes or compulsions. One was over time. Whenever going to a meeting on the battlefield, or just the dentist, he arrived as a second hand moved through the top of the minute. On 18 occasions during war, his arriving on time and leaving on time meant he avoided death from snipers, artillery fire and bombs. Punctuality took on a new meaning and was enshrined as a principle. Monash loved to make order out of chaos. Solving math problems and puzzles was his hobby from an early age, about eight years of age. During his war years, he invited British mathematicians to send him the toughest problems. It was daily calculus on steroids. He liked the problems to be extra difficult and was thrilled by being almost unhinged by them. He got a bigger kick out of solving them. Just ponder what that might mean in a crisis such as a major battle. No confusing or threatening situation was ever too big to take on. Mathematics was Monash's greatest intellectual discipline among many. At the end of his schooling, he won the exhibition at the public exams and went on to earn three degrees in law, arts and engineering at Melbourne University. Sadly, he didn't enrol at Monash. British Prime Minister Desmond, uh, Benjamin Disraeli once said, quote, the weaknesses of great men are the consolation of dunces. Now, by that definition, I must be a bit of a dunce. Monash struggled with and failed Latin at school and university. I was consoled by the fact that I scored 99 and a half in my last Latin exam at school. It was out of 200, and they gave me a sympathetic pass. <laughs> I was also consoled by the fact that he failed his first year at university. Monash was partying. Knowing this made this formidable individual more accessible. Now, as far as his, as his intellect is concerned, he was no better equipped than the brightest among you today. The difference is that very few in our history have applied their minds so rigorously with such impact. Monash once said when handing out a school prize to a young Sir Archibald Glenn who went on to be a leading industrialist, quote, mathematics is the language of the engineer. Monash learnt that language better than most. He became a building engineer. His motive was to create bridges that stayed up. His first effort was the Princess Bridge at Flinders Street. When an age reporter entered the worksite to interview an engineer on the bridge's progress, he was told by a worker that there was only one engineer present, 19-year-old John Monash. Where is he? asked the reporter. He's in a coffer den. It's a makeshift submarine. He made it himself. And what happens if it doesn't work? He'll drown. <laughs> Young Monash survived. The Princess Bridge was built by 1887. It's still up and it looks solid. Constructing things and winning battles drew out the perfectionist in Monash. His capacity to combine all the various elements to succeed in each endeavour was the same. His preparation and attention to detail in both fields were the factors that separated him from others. When engineering projects dried up during the 1890s depression, he turned to the law. He, be he became a specialist in cross-examining witnesses particularly in engineering cases. Monash lost just one courtroom battle in 15 years. And in that case, the opposition lawyers bribed the magistrate. <laughs> he won a case against the nation's finest jurist of that era, Sir Isaac Isaacs, in their only courtroom encounter. After his great war service and his work in educating and repatriating the diggers, Monash was blocked from becoming Prime Minister. 
This position would have been his when he was by far the most popular living Australian. Instead, he became Vice Chancellor of Melbourne University. He also took up the demanding role of creating the Victorian State Electricity Commission from scratch. The equivalent today would be the creation of a multi-billion dollar operation. What sort of character are we dealing with here with John Monash? Well, as you can imagine, he had a ruthless streak. And one example happened on one very hot fire danger day in Melbourne in 1914, when he sent soldiers out on a tough manoeuvre at Lilydale. The age criticised him for endangering the men in the conditions. Monash responded by saying, I am training them for war, not a picnic. He was, however, a most compassionate individual. He was a kind of benevolent godfather figure in his extended family and circle. His sensitivity to those less fortunate than himself was seen most acutely after the war when he helped diggers who suffered. He was behind charities that did much when governments ignored the great sacrifices of tens of thousands of men. Before touching on his wartime achievements, it's instructive to consider the relationship that had most influence on Monash's career. It was with King George V, the Queen's grandfather. They met when the King came to England Salisbury Plain on the 27th of September 1916 to review a march past of 27,000 diggers, making up third division, being trained by Monash. At that vital juncture in history, the Allies, the British and the French, looked likely to lose the war. The Bulgarians, who'd been neutral, sniffed the winds and decided to back the Germans. The King's empire was in danger, and so was he. He needed battle commanders who knew how to win. They were very thin on the ground. The king recognised something in Monash in the two and a half hours they had together on horseback reviewing the march past of these new diggers. The key moment came when the king was prattling on and he uttered the remark, if we win the war, Monash interrupted him without regard for protocol, if we win. The king's demeanour changed. He accepted the correction and of course agreed the allies would win but such certitude from a hardened battle commander at that point was unique. Now, Monash's comment was not that of a chest-beating gung-ho general. His engineer's mind was formulating a way to build a metaphorical bridge to victory. From that moment, destiny beckoned the outsider from far off Melbourne. George V alerted the commander of all allied forces, Field Marshal Haig, until then, Haig had confused Monash, the engineer from Melbourne, Victoria, with Canada's General Curry, the real estate agent, a dodgy one at that, from Melbourne, Ontario. Not anymore. When Monash showed outstanding skill as a commander on the Western Front, his status rose again. But it was not always a smooth path for him. At the Battle of Passchendaele in Flanders in October 1917, he was forced to send Anzacs into a fight that would mean slaughter for his men. A devastated Monash wrote to his wife, I hate the business of war, the horror of it, the waste, the destruction, the inefficiency. My only consolation is the sense of doing my duty to my country, which has placed a grave responsibility on me. I owe something to the men whose lives and honour are in my hand to do as I will. But once my duty is done and honourably discharged, I shall with a sigh of relief turn my back once and for all on the possibility of ever again having to go through such an awful time.
After that terrible Passchendaele experience, Monash vowed that when he was in command of any future battle, such needless losses would never be repeated. Being the king's favourite counteracted all the things that made Monash an outsider, which had impeded him. The leading British historian of the era, Basil Liddell Hart, saw them as, quote, four handicaps of birth. They included being Jewish and having German-born parents. Not a great help when you're at war with Germany. He'd been also a part-time soldier. They were looked down upon by the regular British army officers. He was from a dominion, a recent colony, Australia. Add to these alleged drawbacks C.E.W. Bean, our esteemed war historian, who was working very hard with journalist Keith Murdoch to bring Monash down. Throw in the Prime Minister Billy Hughes, who was looking for a reason to sack Monash, and you have an inkling of the pressure he was under. All this while he was prosecuting battles on the front. By 1918, the opposing forces on the Western Front had belted each other for four years, losing about 10 million men with twice that number wounded. Soldiers were treated as cannon fodder by the high commands of both sides. Through all the madness and slaughter, the Allies had not won a single major battle. That is a real breakthrough victory in the entire conflict on the Western Front. The Germans, under the command of General Erich Ludendorff, made the first major breakthrough on the 21st of March 1918, when 50 divisions, that's about a million and a half men, attacked on an 80 kilometre front. They penetrated through the line about 70 kilometres. In so doing, the Germans destroyed the British Fifth Army and badly dislocated the Third Army. Two British armies were down and there were just five in the field. Monash and his 3rd Division and Ewan Sinclair McGlagan's Australian 4th Division stopped the German advance. Monash's record as a battle commander was confirmed. It helped in the British High Command's next decision to appoint him as commander of the Australian Army, the first AIF, Australian Imperial Force. Finally, in mid-1918, instead of being tacked onto British armies along the front, the Australians joined together as one unified force under his control. It would have eight divisions with, in all, 208,000 soldiers. This made it the biggest of 20 corps on the Allied side. It was seven times the size of our current defence force. His first battle decision was to remove the Germans from the little village of Hamel on the Somme. They could fire into the Australian camp around Villers Bretonneau. Monash wanted Americans next to diggers for the first time in war. He set the battle date quite deliberately for the 4th of July, Independence Day, with an eye to an Australian relationship with the Americans that would la last long into the future. In this and many other ways, he was a true visionary. But this move was not without obstacles. US Commander-in-Chief General Pershing was miffed that Americans were going to be commanded for the first time by a non-American general, and he would not agree. Monash was told this by his immediate superior, commander of the 4th British Army, General Rawlinson. This was despite the Americans being in the line, waiting for the battle to begin. Now, Monash already had a record of standing up to his superiors. He did so again, telling them that the Americans would not be taken out of the battle lines. Rawlinson was rattled. He met Monash at the front. General Monash, you cannot disobey an order from the Commander-in-Chief. But you can. As an Army commander, it is open to you to disobey in light of what you know. Do you want me to be sent back to England? Do you want that risk? Yes, I do. It is more important to keep the confidence of the Americans and the Australians in each other than to preserve an Army commander. But why don't you ask Field Marshal Haig to make a final decision in the knowledge that the battle is set to go and that the Americans are already in the line. Haig left the Americans in the Battle of Hamel. Pershing was presented with a fait accompli, but he did not complain. The Australian US force took 1,500 prisoners. There were 9,000 in that force. 
the force had a minimum of casualties. This should be compared with the French at the Battle of Soissons two weeks later. The French did extremely well, also taking 1,500 prisoners. But they used 400,000 soldiers, 40 times Monash's force, to do it. At Hamel, tanks were used at night for the first time ever. Now, Monash's performance was a novelty, winning while protecting your men and not using them as cannon fodder. He failed on only one count in his eyes. Monash planned the battle to take 90 minutes. It took 93. Uh, he was no shrinking violet. He knew this was his moment for glory for Australia first, as he always put it, and the British Empire second. And he moved to seize it. Over a three-week period in July 1918, he put his master plan for a major breakthrough to the British High Command. His plan for the Battle of Amiens, 120 kilometres north of Paris, was adopted with just two issues that Monash had to fight for. One concerned Chipoli Spur, a ridge in front of Monash's left flank that ran for several kilometres. Germans, heavily armed with artillery, machine guns and snipers, held the high ground. They could fire into the Australian army as it surged towards its objective, which was two German armies. Monash was concerned that the inexperienced new British conscript army on his left flank could not dislodge the Germans from the spur. The High Command insisted that it could. Monash most reluctantly had to let that one go for the moment. The other problem was the French army on his right flank. He was a supreme Francophile, but he could not quite see eye to eye with the French commander Marshal Philippe Pétain. Monash held a conference with the key French and Australian commanders. They could not agree on tactics. Monash said that on the second day of the battle, the 9th of August, he wanted the French to swoop in on his right flank and support his digger army. Pétain said, kept saying, no, my army will fall back. No, nope, we won't go forward. Monash ended the meeting abruptly and told Haig that he wanted the French army removed from his right flank and replaced with the Canadian army. Haig ordered the switch, which had to be done in secret. This in itself was a big logistical exercise. Monash relied much on surprise. He'd requested and received three armies, 400 tanks, 800 planes and countless pieces of artillery. The soldiers and all this weaponry were secretly placed in position before dawn on the 8th of August 1918. The order to fire and attack was given at 4.20 a.m. More than 1,000 guns burst on the unsuspecting enemy. Monash recorded the moment. There was a grand symphony. A great illumination lights up the eastern horizon. The whole complex organisation extending far back to areas almost beyond earshot of the guns begins to move forward. Gunner J. R. Armitage recalled, All hell broke loose, and we heard nothing more. The world was enveloped in sound and flame, and our ears just couldn't cope. The ground shook.
Inside 48 hours, the Australians, with Canadians in support, defeated two German armies in one mighty blitzkrieg. General Ludendorff was forced to draw on other armies along the front in an attempt to hold the line, but the breach was too big. On the morning of the 9th of August, Monash was still irritated by the dangerous force of Germans on Chipperley Spur. He rang General Godley, who was in charge of the British conscripts. As predicted by Monash, they had failed to take the spur. Now, his unprecedented success on the 8th of August had given him a sudden, huge measure of authority and power. He argued with Godley and told him that he wanted a combined Australian and American force to take the spur. Godley backed down. Monash told him that the spur would be, quote, under Australian jurisdiction by 4 p.m. on the 9th of August. And it was. General Ludendorff got the shock of his life, literally. He believed in early August that he could smash through the Allies at Amiens, an industrial town, and then move on quickly to take Paris. Instead, he had to face a massive, unexpected defeat. Ludendorff recorded his thoughts. The 8th of August, 1918, was the blackest day of the war for the German army. We could not now win the war. We could only defend. It was my melancholy duty to inform the Kaiser. On the 11th of August, some of the biggest names of the 20th century, Haig, Churchill, France's Premier Georges Clemenceau, and its Commander-in-Chief, Marshal Ferdinand Foch, converged on the village of Villers Bretonneux to congratulate Monash. The next day, the 12th of August, King George V was quick to confirm his astuteness in the decision to support Monash. He rushed up from Paris to knight him on the battlefield. It was the first time this had been done for more than 500 years at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. He was a king with a German background knighting someone with a German background for defeating a German army. For the numerologists among you, George V, Ludendorff and Monash were all born within a few weeks of each other in 1865. Now this was all very sweet for Monash, but he was also mightily distracted. He wanted to push directly east and finish the war right then. He felt it was the moment to force a complete capitulation. Instead, the High Command ordered him to mark time and push southeast. It was a significant blunder. Had Monash had his way, the entire conflict would have been over in mid-August, not the 11th of November 1918. The key German commanders said, with cynical disdain, that they were so far down for the count after Army R that a direct push east would have terminated the war at that point. Forcing a German surrender quickly would have saved the lives of about a million soldiers on both sides. Instead, the enemy was let off the hook, but it knew it was beaten. So on the 14th of August, German diplomats began to negotiate a peace settlement. The war went on. Monash was held back. The frustration built. He was determined not to stop at the Battle of Amiens. He drew on his legal background and thinking to get the approval for his next move. General Rawlinson agreed with Monash that despite being sidelined, he should, quote, stay in touch with the enemy. Monash made a very broad interpretation of what that meant. In effect, he became a rogue warlord directing his digger fighting machine to pursue the German army and push them off the Somme before the winter of 1819 set in. The Australians began by dislodging the Germans from two positions. The British High Command had deemed impossible to do at Mont Saint Quentin and the fort town of Peron. The retreating Germans destroyed the railway station at Peron before leaving. Rawlinson arrived to congratulate Monash, who could not be found, until someone said, Oh, he's at the railway station. Rawlinson eventually discovered him, ankle deep in mud, directing his engineers to reconstruct the station. Monash did not wish to waste a minute in the pursuit of the enemy. Winter was not far away. 
He ran into a problem when Prime Minister Billy Hughes decided to withdraw Australian Gallipoli veterans from the AAF and send them home. Monash spoke to Haig, who wanted to know Monash, uh, Hughes's motives. He will call an election next year. He wants votes. This will deplete my force. Don't worry, John. I'll give you another army. Douglas, I only wish to command the diggers. Then how do we resolve it? You can give me Americans. Americans, they know nothing about trench warfare. I'll train them. All right, how many do you want? 50,000. Done. Monash and his diggers were a key part of the British force that finally smashed through the last huge German defence fortification, the Hindenburg Line. On the 4th of October, Monash ordered all the diggers out of the war. The job of the Australian Volunteer Force was done and what a job it was. The first AIF under Monash took on 39 German divisions, including the crack Prussian Guard, from July to October and defeated every one of them. There were one million German soldiers in those 39 divisions, the equivalent of the entire German army that had been on the Russian front. In a hideous, glorious 100 days, the diggers liberated 116 French towns and villages. You can go to plenty of them today, where the diggers' efforts are still appreciated, 95 years on. post-war decade in Australia proved you one-off disquiet and a gradual slide to an economic abyss, a depression. There was a police strike in Melbourne in November 1923. The city and suburbs were in chaos with mobs looting and murdering. The shaken state government pleaded with Monash to do something. It was Friday night. He mustered 5,000 diggers in 24 hours and ordered a curfew. By Monday, the mobs were defeated and the diggers controlled the streets. A digger was asked by an Argus newspaper reporter how they cope with the mobs. He replied, We defeated the Prussian guard on the Somme. This was dead easy by comparison. On Tuesday, the curfew was lifted and the Melbourne Cup was run. Monash attended and was cheered. But there were consequences. This Monash action inspired ex-diggers and officers all around the nation. With the economic crisis building, they wanted Monash to be Australia's dictator and to use his former army to take over the federal government. Dictatorship was fashionable at the time. 
the political left and right urged him to be like Mussolini, that's the terms they used, uh, or Lenin, or later Hitler. Monash was furious that the democratic principles he and his men had fought for against dictatorship were being pushed aside by the ambitions of lesser, short-sighted men. He made speeches and did radio and newspaper interviews arguing against such precipitate action. His attitude was summed up in one of the most telling letters in Australian history. It was written to a Sydney-based general who had urged Monash to take over the nation. Monash replied, What do you and your friends want me to do? To lead a movement to upset the constitution, oust the jurisdiction of parliament and usurp the government power? If so, I have no intention to embark on high treason, which any such action would amount to. What would you say if a similar proposal were made by the communists and socialists to seize political power for the benefit of the proletariat and the extinction of the bourgeoisie as they have done in Russia? Would you not call that revolution and treason to the crown and constitution? Depend on it. The only hope for Australia is the ballot box and an educated electorate. You and your people should get busy and form an organisation as efficient, widespread and as powerful as that of the Labor Party. If it be true that many people in Sydney are prepared to trust my leadership, they should be prepared also to trust my judgement. Realising the pressure Monash was under, Labor, Labor Prime Minister James Scullin sent him abroad in late 1930 for the opening of New Delhi. He was told to take a vacation with his partner, Lizette Bentwich, for several months. The force for a violent, unconstitutional change in Canberra was thwarted. It was permanently ended on the 8th of October 1931, when John Monash died of a heart attack. It was brought on by 12 years of high blood pressure post-war. He was 66. Sir John Monash left an unmatched legacy as a Renaissance man and visionary, as a soldier, engineer, lawyer, educator, and lover of the arts. No Australian in history has achieved more. It is fitting that a grand tertiary institution, now one of the finest in the world, carries his name. Thank you. Thank you, Roland Perry, for your generosity in sharing your time, expertise, and great knowledge with us about the man who is probably the greatest Australian who ever lived. Please join me in thanking Roland again. I'm sure you all agree that tonight has been an absolute tour de force and the evening wouldn't have been complete without the immense talents of composer Professor Mary Finsterer. Musicians. <laughs> Musicians Kenji uh, Fujimura, Ishun Chukmukchiglu, Rachel Atkinson, Emma Charles, Emma Chepjan and actor Dr. Felix Nobis. Thank you.